Whitebagging is the practice of requiring a third-party pharmacy to dispense a drug that requires administration by a clinician in a healthcare facility. The drug is sent to a hospital or physician office on a one-off basis for administration to the patient. In effect, white bagging prohibits a hospital or doctor's office from using their own medication inventory in caring for patients, and it circumvents built-in safety mechanisms providers have in place to ensure the safety and efficacy of the drugs used in their facility. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederley with AHA Communications. Joining me today to discuss the problems posed by the practice of whitebagging are two AHA experts. Mark Howell is Director of Policy and Patient Safety, and Michelle Millerick is Senior Associate of Health Insurance Coverage. Mark and Michelle, thanks for coming on the Advancing Health podcast today. Let me ask you guys, what, tell us more, if you would, about what is driving this trend. Why are health insurers requiring hospitals to get drugs from outside specialty pharmacies instead of using their own supply? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tom, for the question. So this is really happening because of increases in ownership and consolidation between health insurers and specialty pharmacies. So insurers are increasingly acquiring their own pharmacy benefit managers and specialty pharmacies, and really they're financially benefiting from pulling drugs out of the hospital where they're administered in a hospital setting and driving that business to their own owned or affiliated pharmacies. And as you'll hear about, and uh, Mark will talk about a little bit more, some of the patient safety issues, uh, but really at the core of this, you know, we view this as a safety issue and also a business issue where, where plans are sort of benefiting from these practices, often at the expense of patients and the hospitals who take care of them. Well, Mark, can you talk a little bit more about uh, what Michelle just uh, referenced, the specific safety issues and concerns that white bagging poses? How are these policies actually putting patients at risk? Sure, Tom, thanks. So just to take a step back, right, the way drugs and medications are typically managed or have been in a hospital setting is patient requires X type of treatment, the hospital uses the traditional buy and bill methodology. So they've got inventory on hand, stock on hand. They determine what the treatment is, the medication is for that patient. From their inventory, they prepare it, they get it ready for treatment, and then it's delivered up to the patient's room through infusion or injection, whatever the, the, the type of treatment is. And so the hospital's got line of sight into this product from day one. They order it, they maintain it, they control the supply chain there. And so they can guarantee a high level of safety and efficacy whenever they're preparing and administering that drug. When we enter into the white bagging space, what happens is the commercial insurer essentially says, you hospital, we're not using your drug anymore. So what's going to happen is patient needs X type of treatment. The provider makes that determination. And then when they run it through the insurer, the insurer says, that's a white bagging drug. It's a drug that falls under our white bagging policy. As a result, you have to get it through our third-party specialty pharmacy, this non-hospital affiliated pharmacy that oftentimes has some type of financial relationship with the commercial insurer, either they're owned or they're directly affiliated with them. This poses a wide range of issues, right? So first of all, the hospital now no longer has the ability to control that drug in-house. They have to wait for the third-party specialty pharmacy to mail that drug to the hospital. No line of sight into how that drug was prepared, how it was handled, how it was stored. It shows up on the doorstep, and then the hospital is responsible for maintaining that product until they are administering it to the patient. But we don't know where it came from. We don't have that traditional line of sight. So it, it poses this initial set of safety concerns of how was this product managed and handled along the way? And is it, was it handled and stored safely enough so that we can guarantee that it's safe for the patient? And then we've got this secondary component where what happens if the wrong dosage shows up? Or what happens if the the delivery carrier doesn't deliver the package on time? Or a patient's test result says, today you need this dose instead of that. The hospital can't make that change. And so the result is significant, significant delays in treatment. We've heard stories, you know, ranging from individuals who need cancer therapy treatment. And they've had to wait six, eight, ten weeks because of delays in, in getting that medication. We've got a couple of examples that we've pulled in the past, and I just want to highlight one of them. It's, it's a young man named Landon, just a child. Um, he's got cerebral palsy, requires Botox injections, right? They help loosen his muscles. 
but the treatment was delayed by more than a month because of these white bagging requirements. So rather than the hospital just having that drug on hand and using it and then billing for it, now they've got to wait for the insurer to talk to the third party specialty pharmacy to mail it to the hospital. And then we've entered this realm of long, long delays to care for a young child who needs this at a certain time during treatment. So that's, I mean, that's an overview of where we are, but patient safety really is the key component to this right now. I can understand certainly why somebody would be uh, alarmed at hearing the, the story that you just shared. Uh, so how are hospitals and other healthcare providers managing these situations to keep patients safe? What happens now is we're in a situation where hospitals have to treat the patient in front of them. It's their mission. It's what they're going to do, right? And so to manage white bagging policies, you have to set up two different streams of how you're handling products. So we've got the traditional buy and bill product that's on site, that's handled, purchased by the hospital and administered. Staff is very well equipped to, to manage that inventory, know what's in stock, know how to handle it, how to store it. And then you've got this second separate track where you have to dedicate full-time employees, mainly pharmacy and supply chain staff, to be in receipt of incoming product, store it appropriately, make sure it's tagged and, and marked for a specific patient, and then make sure that it's administered properly. But what happens, you know, in the earlier example, what happens if a patient's test result comes back and it requires a different type of medication, a different level of dosage, and the third-party specialty pharmacy drug that was white-bagged isn't that dosage level? The staff in the hospital now has two options, really, right? They can scramble to figure out alternative therapy, do something in-house to treat that patient there, or they have to delay treatment. Neither is a good option. And so we find ourselves in a situation where hospitals that are already overburdened are already struggling to, to deal with workforce issues are dedicating more and more man hours to managing this issue. Um, and so when we talk to, to our members, patient safety is the number one concern here. And it's reached certain, certain points where patients need the treatment then and there. There's a squabble with the insurer over the white bagging policy and the hospital makes the decision, we're gonna treat the patient and we just won't be reimbursed for this. We're gonna eat that cost to benefit the patient and get them out the door, make sure they are healthier than when they walked in. Um, and so we find ourselves in a situation where insurers are saying, this is the safer, more effective way to manage medication. But in reality, we've taken a three-step process, ballooned it into a 12-step process and now we're requiring the providers to figure out how to make it work. And quite frankly, it's not fair to providers, but it's certainly not fair and it's not safe for patients. You know, I was just thinking, Michelle, uh, if somebody were listening to this podcast at home or if I were, I think the first question that would pop into my head is why is this even legal? No, it's a great question, and I think it's a lot of patients and families that get caught up in these policies and are sort of struggling to understand, you know, what the barrier is. And I think we view it from, you know, sort of the larger scope of commercial insurers, uh, sort of erecting barriers that can sometimes restrict and limit and delay access to care. And sometimes it's this sort of approach of, you know, we throw everything, you know, under the sun out there to, to sort of see what sticks and ask for forgiveness later. And, you know, I, I do think, to your point, like we do have concerns, um, you know, some of these practices, you know, in, in theory really are... Um, um, inconsistent with many state board of registration and pharmacies uh, regulations that prohibit things like redispensing. Going forward, what are some of the policy solutions that could help address these safety issues? Yeah, absolutely. So not surprisingly, you know, given all the, the patient safety issues and concerns with these practices, legislation has been filed in 17 states just this year alone to try to curb these practices. And we're seeing a few different approaches, but most of them center around prohibiting payers or insurers from mandating that hospitals or, or healthcare providers get drugs from an outside specialty pharmacy. You know, in some states, they're looking at how specialty medications are defined because there isn't a national definition for what a specialty medication is. Um, and so making sure that if things have to go through a specialty channel or are white bagged, that there's sort of a, a standardized definition of what those things are. Um, and really also trying to make the, take the approach of making sure that if a hospital is a contracted, has a specialty pharmacy that's contracted with the health plan, that they have to be allowed to dispense that medication to make sure that the care isn't fragmented and that they're able to sort of fully and inclusively take care of their patients in their clinics with, with all the tools um, that they have, including medication. And I think really the bottom line is it here is that, you know, there's lots of sort of activity going on in this area at the state level. Um, but our view is really that insurers shouldn't be able to require um, that hospitals can't use their own drugs to manage patient care the best and safest way that they see fit. Well, wrapping up, a question for both of you. So to sum up, is this a, 
a responsibility that patients need to take on themselves now uh, and ask questions about where their drugs are coming from and whether they're uh, as safe as they can be? Is this something a patient needs to, to, to worry about? It's a great question, Tom. And I think about those patients that have significant delays in treatments, especially the pediatric patients, right? Because not only you can't explain this to that patient, you've got to explain it to the family as well. And so if you've had a, a treatment that's been delayed by eight or 10 weeks, there's an, a necessary education process that has to go into that. I think the, the more difficult and challenging component of all of this is even providers, these rules are changing on a, on a weekly or monthly basis, right? Drugs that previously weren't under white bagging policies are the next week and providers have 30 or 60 days to come into compliance with that. And so that landscape is, is ever moving and ever evolving. And when we think about how you educate the patient, I think the first and foremost thing we need to talk about is commercial insurers have a responsibility to let providers and their customers, our patients know what they can and should expect through their health care. And to make these changes midstream creates a really, really difficult problem. So I think it's a prudent question to ask. I think providers are going to have a responsibility to walk their patients through this so they know what's happening and why it's happening. But it also brings up a host of other questions and concerns that, that come from that, right? What does this mean? How do I change my policy to fix this? What does it mean for hospital liability? All of those things now start to bubble up. Well, Michelle, anything to add? You know, as you were talking, it made me think of, you know, we talked a lot about the effects on patients in terms of the safety considerations, but also sort of financially for patients and thinking about what they, you know, might need to ask as they're interacting with the healthcare system. These policies often really shift costs to patients, too, because oftentimes the way sort of insurance benefits are designed, if a patient gets a drug in a clinic through their own hospital's inventory, Typically, it's not universally true, but typically they pay a sort of a copay, a fixed flat rate sort of fee for that. Maybe it's a $20 copay for the doctor's office visit when they go in. Under these policies, usually the specialty drugs fit under the pharmacy benefit. And more oftentimes than not, a patient is going to have coinsurance on that, which means that they pay a percentage of the cost of the drug. Um, so if this is a $10,000 drug and they have 20% coinsurance on that, you know, they're no longer just paying that $20 copay. And so aside from all of these other sort of safety issues, and as Mark is describing, you know, the hospital then sort of takes on this role of really, you know, trying to explain to the patient what their insurance benefits are and how these policies might be resulting in delays in care and, and all these kind of other, you know, myriad of effects. And then at the end of the day, these things could also result in patients getting much bigger bills. And so I wish the, the answer wasn't that patients have to be thinking about that at the point of care, but I think it is sort of one of the things in this like complex arrangement of, um, you know, white bagging that comes up. That's where we are right now. Thank you so much both for coming on uh, Advancing Health today to talk about a problem that I think a lot of people don't even realize really exists, but certainly worth uh, shedding a little light on it. So thank you so much for your time. You've been listening to Mark Howell, Director of Policy and Patient Safety, and Michelle Millerick, who is Senior Associate of Health Insurance Coverage with the American Hospital Association. This has been Advancing Health, a podcast from AHA. Thank you for joining us.